Hello, thank you everybody for, for coming along to this uh, Clone Native Asturias September edition. Uh, thank you for all the attendees, all, all the speakers, and I will just make the introduction and go further with the, with the speakers and the amazing talks that they have for us. As you know, uh, we are uh, Clone Native Asturias, an official uh, cloud, uh, Clone Native uh, community group that, that we have uh, to put uh, Asturias in the global map in the worldwide uh, knowledge. As usual, in this kind of events, we have a con uh, code of conduct, nothing fancy, right? Just be respectful for, uh, with the rest of uh, the people, uh, be nice, and that's more than, than okay. Uh, and starting with the speakers, and again, uh, thinking about to put Asturias in the map, you can see here that uh, in this case, we have a, a speaker coming from, from Orense uh, in Galicia, which is pretty, pretty close uh, to Asturias or region. You can see that by car, we have uh, several options, but in less than four hours, you can you can reach. Unfortunately, we have a lot of mountains over there, so it's a bit more uh, far than, than you that could uh, be expected. And also, in case you come from London or even from Scotland, right, and uh, you can you can get a plane. Uh, of course, you can uh, come by car, but maybe by car is a bit, uh, yeah, uh, 17 hours, maybe it's too much. Uh, and from London, honestly, I don't know if it's six hours. I would expect less than that, hopefully. But that's what the Google Maps say. So let's see. <laughs> you could also get the ferry to Santander from somewhere True. in the south. Yeah. Indeed. Indeed. Actually, I don't know why Google Maps, we have to do a feature request actually to Google Maps for that. <laughs> okay, as usual, this event, uh, we'll, uh, you can follow it at, in the social networks. Okay, I will be posting in the, in the social networks in between um, the, the talks. Uh, these are the hashtags, Cloud Native Asturias or CN, CNA SEP21. Okay. The agenda for today, uh, we will start uh, with uh, Daniel Gonzalez uh, with the first talk about practical observability. And after that, with uh, Matt Jarvis about the strange danger, how attackers can own your Kubernetes cluster. Uh, both of them, I can tell you, they are very interesting topics. Starting with, uh, with Daniel. Uh, Daniel is working at uh, k6.io. Uh, uh, working in observability, distributed system, this kind of stuff. Also now uh, he's working in, in Grafana, as may, some of you may know, uh, Grafana is, is taking this, this company to make everything uh, super, super cool, but also uh, Daniel is maintaining the Grafana tempo uh, in his time, right? And of course we have uh, Matt. Matt is senior developer advocate at Sync. Uh, Sync is one of the most important companies in the cloud native ecosystem, right? A lot of experience working in distributed system and now more focus on the cloud infrastructure. And you can see Matt in many, many uh, events like this, uh, pro, uh, offering his uh, tremendous knowledge about all these uh, kind of topics. So thank you both for coming, coming here. I think it's gonna be a great session today. Uh, as usual, you can see in, in, the, in your screen that uh, you can access to the chat and you can access to the QA. We'll have QA for sure. Uh, you can put there, I uh, will open just in, in one second, the QA, the q &A. So you can drop your questions over there. We will gather all the questions and at the end of each session, uh, we will, uh, let's say, speak loud uh, these questions to the speakers for them to, to answer. I would say with this, this is all. So I will stop sharing. And we will start with uh, Daniel Gonzalez. So, Danny, the stage is yours. I will try to share. Uh, meanwhile, thank you, uh, Marcos and Cloud Native Asturias for letting me speak about things here. <laughs> so, yeah, today we're going to talk about practical observability. Um, yeah, let me, yeah, it's working. Before everything, I'm Daniel. I, I already was presented by, by Marcos, but yeah, I wanted to say that you can reach me on a few places after the talk or yeah, on the chat. So please feel free to me if, if you want. So let's get started with what's observability. Uh, there are multiple definitions, multiple approaches. People think differently about this, but for me, observability is all about being able to ask questions 
about your software, about your infra, about whatever you're running. And it's about being able to ask questions and get answers without having to stop your application, um, add some code or change whatever you're running, right? It's about getting all these questions out of the box with data on the fly, with signals and telemetry that your applications are exposing. There are multiple signals that can be used to give you this, this let's say, observability. Uh, the most common ones are metrics, traces, and logs. We'll cover them uh, a bit, a bit uh, about each one of them during this presentation. But also, I wanted to cover something that is not that common, and that's profiles. Uh, profiles is something that not a lot of people use uh, in production right now. Um, I would like to, to take a look at that. So yeah, let's go ahead. First one, logs. Um, logs is just your application emitting messages, right? Uh, you can write whatever you want on that message. Um, that's it. I put a more fancy definition on the slides, but keeping things simple, that's, that's what they do. One important thing about logs is that they don't have a predefined structure, right? You can put whatever you want on it. Um, yeah, call it a day. Still, us as engineers, we have found that having some conventions are useful around logs. That's why we use levels. Levels is about giving each log some kind of priority. Uh, so for example, error has a bigger priority than debug. Um, with this kind of levels, we can use them, for example, to, to trigger alerts based on logs and to more or less understand what each log line means and, um, from, from a quick look. Use cases for logs, a lot. Main one can be troubleshooting your applications. If your application is logging whatever it's doing, you can read the logs, understand what's happening, and yeah, fix it. Also, compliance and even support, right? You can support your customers being able to read the logs from whatever they were doing. I wanted to start with logs uh, on this presentation because I feel that for someone that has no grace of observability in their, in their applications, it's the easiest one to start with. Um, yeah, this is how easy it is. I picked Python as a language for this example because, yeah, I don't know why, but <laughs> what's a, a handy one. And usually for logging, you have to add, or you have to import some kind of library. Uh, most languages have on the standard library functionalities for, for logging. Um, so for example, here we are importing logging in Python. Then we are setting the log level as debug. I will explain what this means later. And we are going to, log a message, in this case, a debug type message that says, this will get log. And as you can see, we execute the code and yeah, we get a log line, fancy. So probably you're wondering what is, uh, why we are setting the level. Um, in logging libraries, usually you can set the level and that means that it's going to output in some way uh, all the messages that have that level or above. This is useful, for example, if you wanna, if you want to print all the messages that are info or above, you can put info as a level and you're going to get that. But see, for example, you have your application, I don't know, you are developing it or whatever, and you want to get those debug logs, you can put it on a lower level for that case. Once you have that, uh, probably your, your, your standard library of your language or whichever application like library that you wanted to use for logging supports a, a bunch of outputs. Uh, most common one usually is a standard output, just show me whatever is happening. But uh, in, in production or in some other cases, you want to use files, uh, store the logs in a file, or send them over HTTP to somewhere, or even use syslog and things like that. There are endless options and just depends on the library that you are using. Nice. Um, that's handy. That's how you add logs to your application. but. If you have multiple applications, you have to somehow collect all those logs, right? And probably you want to process them, probably add the stuff, maybe remove the stuff, maybe rename the stuff. Um, probably you want also to send all those logs to some backend where you can query all the logs for your, for your services. That's where these two terms come into place. Uh, one is pipeline and another one is backend. I feel that they are like the, the, the only two requirements if you want to have some kind of logging stack in place. The pipeline is the one that is it's able to scrape the logs or receive the logs. It's going to be able to process them, to find the stuff with them, and forward them to some backend. 
and the backends, as I said, is the one that will store them for maybe medium, maybe maybe long term. Um, yeah, let you query it, query them and do fancy stuff. Uh, if I have to recommend some someone that doesn't have expertise with these tools, uh, a place to get started, maybe I am a little biased, right? Because I have a huge relationship with Grafana, but I really like the combo Prontail and Loki. They are easy to get started and there are a lot of tutorials online, but also you can't go wrong picking FluentD. This is a cloud native foundation project and it's very well supported and supports ton of things for inputs, outputs, processing. It's really, really cool. On the other hand, on the backends, it just depends on your use case. So I would say that picking any one of them is right. So yeah, don't, don't think it too much. One last thing about logs. I wanted to say that even if usually logs don't have any kind of formal structure, it's a good practice <laughs> to add structures to, to your logs. This is something that normally is agreed uh, on a company to try to use like the, the same format and stuff like that. Um, here we're talking about just logging everything in JSON or logging everything on this format that you see on the screen uh, that is called log FMT, right? Because if you have this standard format, even if it's only inside of your company, uh, all your services will have yeah the same format and you can do queries and it is going to work on different type of services and you can reuse a lot of stuff. So yeah, just wanted to mention that. Let's jump onto metrics. Metrics are numeric representations of data. And as the slide says, they fall into two main categories. Data that is already numeric and data distilled into numbers. With data that is already numeric, I mean, for example, if your application has some kind of uh, temperature measurement, right? This data is already numeric, so yeah, it's a metric. And on the other hand, with data this ties to numbers, is for example the the number of requests uh, per second that my service is is having, yeah, or something like that. Just extracting that metric from other data. Usually there are a lot of options uh, regarding metrics data model. The most common one is, as you see on the screen, having some kind of, some kind of metric name. Uh, and then this metric usually has some kind of labels. Um, it has some value, right? Each combination of these, of these things, of metric name, labels, um, and labels, is going to generate a new unique metric. We will talk about why this is important later, but yeah. This is just some basic structure used usually by metric systems. So yeah. Also, it's interesting that usually metric system let you create different types of metrics. You can have counters, gauges, stereograms. It just depends on the metric system. I can't cover all of them here, but it's just a nice to know. And probably you're wondering, OK, I have logs to understand what happens on my service, so trying to troubleshoot it. Why I need metrics? Metrics are a good thing to have that high level overview in general of your services. For example, knowing the throughput of some service, the number of errors, all that stuff, right? Even the even having an historiogram with the with the latencies to have some percentage and understanding the latency of some service. So it's pretty useful for real time monitoring of services and even alerting on top of that data. Also trending, seeing how historically this service has performed and analysis. Getting started is a bit more complex, uh, I have to admit, that with logging, usually standard libraries don't have support for metrics, maybe in the future. But here I will use, uh, well, I'm using a, a Prometheus client. Prometheus is a, is a metric system that I will cover later, but yeah, just so you can see how this would work. Uh, what I'm doing is I'm just creating two types of metrics, one gauge and one counter. For Prometheus, a gauge can take any value. So for example, you can see that I'm increasing it, decreasing it, setting it as something. And on the other hand, my counter only goes up. Um, it has two levels that I can put if I want. This is, as I say, a very, very small example, but it's just to, to show you how easy it's to add some metrics on your service and how you can get that data out of it. Um, when I said that metrics, they don't have uh, a formal data model in general, it just depends on the tool. 
it's also about the approach because in logging usually most people do it like the same way or pretty similar but in metrics there are like two two big two big teams there is like the team pooling where the monitoring system pulls the metrics from some application normally or sometimes this application exposes the metrics in some kind of http endpoint or something like that and on the other hand we have a push method where your application knows where your monitoring system is and pushes metrics like it's time or something like that. The line between both is it's uh, a little fuzzy lately. Uh, there are tools that are following both approaches at the same time. Um, yeah, still, if I'm a newcomer, I'm taking a look into metrics, I will say the friendliest and the biggest ecosystem to get into now is Prometheus. This is also a cloud native project and it has at the bottom some booth words about other related projects or even technologies or terminology. Uh, I just think that it's a really good place to get started with metrics. It's a pool based metrics, usual, like a pool based metric system. Usually it supports also push with some other tweaks, but yeah, uh, as you saw how we added that instrumentation to the Python code, we will be able to deploy a Prometheus instance and say to Prometheus, hey, Prometheus, scrape my application. And every 15, 15 seconds, uh, Prometheus will scrape that data, store it, and uh, let you query it and graph it. So yeah, that's all, all the basics of Prometheus, I will say. We don't have time to cover it, but yeah, it's a good place to start. One last thing about metrics. Uh, High cardinality labels um, data in general is bad for metrics. Um, with high cardinality, I mean, you can see that we have three labels. We have method, root, and le. Uh, these, these, these labels have very low cardinality, but if you have one label, for example, IP, right? That has a huge cardinality, maybe you have one per client. Uh, that's going to incur very few costs on Prometheus in resources, then on query time. I mean, it's really troublesome to work with that type of data. Also, if you are using some kind of vendor, usually they are going to build you based on the number of different metrics and you don't want to have endless different metrics. So just one tip or something to keep in mind if you are adopting some kind of metric system, usually high cardinality is not that good. Um, yeah, okay. We can understand what's happening in our application with those logs, right? We can get that overview with the metrics. But what if my application is not a monolith? What if my application is a microservices application with 10 services using HTTP and message query and I don't know, ERPC? Things start getting harder because when you're running a monolith application locally, you can see that if it crashes, you are going to get a stack trace, right? That shows you where it fails and what happens to the rest of components that interact on that monolith. But if you have multiple services, uh, distributed architecture, it's not that easy. Uh, that's where distributed tracing comes into play. It is a technique of understanding to understand what happens during a distributed transaction. So, the thing is that with tracing, you add some kind of instrumentation to your services so you can inject some data on the on the requests and on the on the on the, on the calls that you are doing inside each each program, and you can track this uh, over multiple services. There are some concepts. Uh, a span is the minimal unit of work uh, that that composes a trace. A trace is composed of multiple spans. Um, each span can have chills, can have parents, and you can append a lot of data onto, onto each span. This is not clear right now, but I'm sure that with the next screenshot on the next slide, it will come clearer on how this works. There are multiple use cases for, for tracing from anomaly detection to performance optimization, troubleshooting. But for me, the biggest benefit is with logging, I know why something happened with metrics i know what's happening and with traces usually i know where it's happening right i can track that i can understand on which service or if i had some kind of cascading failure or things like that so yeah this is the promised image 
And as you can see, this is a trace. It's composed of spans. Each span has some kind of chills. You can see that each span has some a was created by some service. You can see that the front end called front end, front end, front end, then called customer, then called MySQL. You can see the name of the span is the name of the action. So, for example, we can see that on the MySQL database, the SQL select took those milliseconds to complete. And if we click on that, we can even see the query that we use, right? And a lot of data that we can inject onto, onto each span. It's very fancy to, to having that, that overview of the, of the full transaction. The stack is fairly similar uh, to, to, to the login stack. I didn't put an example here because it doesn't fit on a slide. <laughs> but there are like three things that you need. You need some kind of instrumentation, you need some kind of pipeline, and you need some kind of backend. If we are talking about instrumentation, usually people tend to recommend open telemetry. Uh, this is a very huge cloud native foundation project that is like, yeah, but still, it's still on, on, on its early stages, open telemetry is the merge of open tracing and open census. And if I has to instrument a real service from scratch right now, probably I will go with, with open tracing. There are a lot of docs online, and it should be pretty easy to get an app instrumented in almost any language. Also, I wanted to mention that instrumentation is moving towards to non-instrumentation uh, with something called auto-instrumentation. That sounds a bit strange, but it's just about instrumenting your code without having to add any kind of code. It's like everything is external, and it's something that the open telemetry and open tracing folk are working on. Once you have that, once your application is instrumented, you can send those spans, those traces to some pipeline. Uh, there is open telemetry collector and Grafana agent. Both are good options, both supports a lot of inputs, outputs, and processing options for whatever you wanna do. So you can't go wrong with any of them. Also on the backend, clearly I'm a bit biased. I like Tempo, I think it's a, uh, a truly good piece of software, but still, Jagger is the king of the hill, right? On on, on tracing, uh, you can't go go with any of those either. So if you want to get started with tracing, pretty fast, pretty easy. I would say pick a open tracing tutorial, even open telemetry if you feel risky. Deploy some kind of pipeline, both work, and um, just get one backend running in a container and play with it. Uh, there's like no better way to to learn it. I would say. Um, yeah, that was the main part of the talk. <laughs> now this, 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 this wasn't expected to talk about this, but I added it because I thought that it was pretty interesting. And there is this new type of signal, this new type of telemetry that is picking up in adoption, and that's profiles. Uh, profiles is just a form of, I mean, profiling is a form of dynamic program analysis that measures different things. For example, you can measure uh, as you can see on, on the slide, the complexity of a program or the use of the heap or the use of the CPU or all that fancy stuff. It's going to output some kind, there are like different formats. Uh, I think this is pprof, if I remember well. Um, it's going to output this data that you see. Uh, it's pretty difficult to read uh, uh, like that, but usually you use some kind of flame graph or things like that to graph it and to understand which piece of code is taking the most time or eating the most resources. The main use case is performance engineering. Uh, obviously you, you can do that um, and get a quick view on, for example, that function that is uh, taking most of the CPU cycles, but also it's handy for troubleshooting. For example, in case your, your system gets some um, out of memory, you can go back Check your profile and yeah, understand what happened. Getting started with profiling, in, on this case with pprof uh, in Go, it's pretty easy. In fact, uh, we're just spawning a server for pprof and yeah, importing it. That's it. That's going to serve on that test point a lot of data about about profiling, about the heap about the go routines. For example, we got a go routines leak like some weeks ago. And we found it using profiling. It was pretty sweet and pretty easy. Um, 
two last things about profiling and is that there are like different types of profilers. There are like profilers where you don't touch the goals that just read the memory or like the, the CPU and try to extract what, uh, what each program is using. And then you have instrumenting profilers where you have to add something to the code and, and it's going to add this instrumentation. Also, I wanted to mention that uh, there is something called continuous profiling that is the real reason why profiling is picking up again because as a technology profiling is not that new, but continuous profiling, yeah, it seems to be. Um, and continuous profiling is about using the same approach that you, for example, can use with your metrics or your logs, but with profiles. Tools like Comprof, Pyroscope, and ProfFE let you scrape or receive profiles continuously. So for example, in case you have that, that, <clears throat> that program crashing because of an out of memory, you can quickly go back in time, check the profile right after the crash and understand, uh, for example, what ate uh, all the memory. It's a pretty powerful tool. Uh, still on, on its infancy, all the tools on this ecosystem, but it's something nice to look at for the future, I would say. Um, no one cares if you have a lot of data and you do anything, nothing with it, right? So with all this data, you want to do three things. You want to explore it, you want to visualize it, and you want to correlate it. Uh, I will say it again, uh, probably I'm a little biased, but usually Grafana is the right tool for the job here, right? Uh, Grafana supports tons of data sources, all of them that we have that I have talked about on this presentation. So you can query the data on whichever way you want. You can visualize it, creating fancy dashboards like this one, mixing different data sources, and also you can correlate it. Uh, correlation is something that people people don't think a lot about, but just having the same labels uh, on on all your types of telemetry data is a huge step forward. Tools like Grafana or even vendors like Datadog can give you these insights and let you make these jumps, for example, from a log to a metric, um, from a metric to a trace, and stuff like that. So you can have all linked um, on one coherent system instead of three types or four types of data that don't match together. That was all. I hope I'm in time. Um, <laughs> and yeah, I going to leave this link here. I will share it on the chat with both with good observability related resources. There are a few links about each topic that I talk about uh, that I think that for beginners, even for non-beginners can be helpful to, to take a look at. Just learn more about it. Thanks. Cool. Uh, thank you very much, Daniel. I think it was a, a great talk. Uh, thank you very much. And also the resources that uh, you, you are sharing. I think it, this, is, this is great for the people. I'm very, very uh, welcome. Uh, so yeah, we have uh, we have some questions here. We have um, uh, Alberto Carrasco is saying, I wanted to ask you about FluentD. Do you have any experience with it? If so, do you see it uh, clearly better or worse in comparison with some other applications you mentioned for log scraping? I will say that FluentD or FluentB even that is like the lightweight option are just the best ones uh, on, on this pipeline step for, for, for logging. For example, Promptail is pretty optionated. I mean, it works truly well with, 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 with Loki, but not with other kind of backends. Fluentd just works. You can use any kind of input, any kind of output. The list is uh, huge, and the list of processors is also pretty huge. Uh, we have used it a bit. Um, Resource-wise, it was not hungry, even if you think that it's written in Ruby, the critical path is, is in C. So I would say it's a pretty good tool. Uh, if I have to think about an alternative or something, some project that can be better in the future, maybe I will take a look at Vector. Uh, it's a pretty cool project too. I'm not sure if it's on the Cloud Native Foundation, but yeah, both are good options, just, yeah. Cool, nice. Thank you very much for, for the answer. Uh, actually, yes, uh, FluentD. Uh, when when you search in the internet to to have like an aggregate of, of, of data from different sources to different targets, uh, is one of the main ones that appear in the in the Google at least. So this is this is great. Uh, actually, I have a question. Uh, uh, and, uh, 
uh, please people if uh, you have more questions just drop it uh, either in the in the chat or in the q a uh, i was wondering in terms of uh, tracing for example uh, in your example uh, we see very clear that the tracing was was crossing different services i don't know what is the strategy and how difficult it is when you have uh, like a message broker in the middle or a queue system in the middle how what is the strategy with that yeah so there is this context right that uh, all the spans need to have to understand that they are part of the same trace usually if you want to have uh, communicate multiple services and you want to continue the trace you have to use some kind they call it the format proper like propagators to propagate mm -hmm. this context from one service to another mm -hmm. In HTTP, this is pretty simple. There are multiple propagators. There are already like libraries to inject that data into the headers of the HTTP request and move it to the next mm -hmm. service. But it just depends, right? For example, I know that for RabbitMQ, there are some already like working out of the box instrumentation for some languages. But if not, I won't say that it's easy, but it is as easy as taking that shipping it on whatever file your message queue has, right? And like inject it and read it on the other end. Okay. So yeah, <laughs> I will say that that's yeah. the best approach. Cool, cool, thank you very much. We have another question in this occasion from uh, Joaquin Castaño. Uh, I don't see many people talking about long-term storage of metrics, for instance, storing them in some database like uh, InfluxDB and then creating dashboards in Grafana. Is that not a common use case? It's a common use case. The problem with, for example, Prometheus is that out of the box, it's not good for long-term storage, right? Uh, it's not coded in that way. It doesn't support high availability out of the box. There are uh, some rough blocks. If you want to take a look at scaling metrics, long-term storage, and all that stuff, I would recommend taking a look at Thanos and Cortex. Uh, Grafana is using Cortex at a scale to you for their metric system, the cloud system that we provide to customers. So you can't go wrong, go, go wrong with, with those. They support huge amounts of traffic, uh, like crazy. <laughs> I don't want to say numbers, but crazy. And also the long-term storage that you are wondering on fast queries and all that stuff. So, yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Joaquin, as well for, for, the, for the question. Uh, let me see if we have uh, some other question. Not by the moment. However, guys, if you have a further question for, for Daniel, the chat is over there. Don't hesitate. Daniel will stay uh, for, for a while, just in case you have more questions. And now let's go for the, for the next session uh, from Matt, Matt Jarvis. Uh, Matt, uh, the stage is yours. Excellent. Thank you. Right, let's uh, just move this out of the way for a second. And I think I'm going to share this one. Everyone seeing my screen there? Yeah, we can Excellent. See it. Excellent. Right. So uh, this is me. As we heard earlier, I, I work in developer relations at Sneak. And Sneak are a uh, cloud native security company. And that's what we're going to be talking about um, in this talk today. So the starting point for this for this kind of demo is that most exploits in the real world um, where, you know, there's been big data breaches and big impacts on, on companies are a combination of a vulnerability in a specific application, but usually combined with misconfiguration in our infrastructure. And misconfiguration um, enables that attacker to widen the blast radius of the particular exploit. And this is something that all attackers are looking for. Um, when uh, when trying to, to breach systems is how do we widen our, our attack? And uh, today we're gonna to be talking about this in the context of Kubernetes. Um, Kubernetes is, is a fantastic platform obviously, but it's, you know, it's, it's kind of insecure by default. Um, and that's, you know, that's not a bug, that's a, a feature, you know, Kubernetes lets you do lots of different things, but you really need to understand um, uh, some of these security modes in order to uh, to protect ourselves from from um, from attackers. So our starting point 
um, today is that um, we have found a remote command execution vulnerability. And this is mocked up for the purposes of, of this particular demo, but lots of these exist in the wild. Um, I was looking at, at one of these in, in Tomcat the other day. And so all we know at this point is that we have um, connected to a vulnerable application uh, on the internet. And I'm also going to introduce our timeline of doom. And this is going to show how over time um, we are able to expand the scope of our of our particular um, exploit and, uh, and, and expand the blast radius. So what can we do from here? So our um, remote command execution uh, vulnerabilities typically allow you to run uh, commands locally on the uh, on the um, on the server that, that's running the, the vulnerable application. Um, by using uh, uh, specially crafted URLs. So the first thing we might start is to look at the in environment variables that our application is running in. Environment variables tell us lots of interesting things, particularly in the container world, and most applications are usually running in containers these days. So as we can see, our environment variables have backed up our initial assumption that we might be running in a Kubernetes cluster. Uh, there's lots of references to Kubernetes here. Um, we have now the IP address and the uh, the port for the internal IP address of the um, API server. And we can see that we're running a, a, a Kubernetes service on port 5000. And uh, so we, we've managed to, to learn quite a lot of things from, uh, from that um, command. So if we go back to our slides now, um, we can. We know that we're running in a Kubernetes cluster. We know, you know, that that we're running in a pod. We know we're exp exposing a service on port eight, uh, five thousand that's then being um, being ingressed somehow from port eighty, and we've found the internal IP of the um, of the API server of the Kubernetes cluster. So, what else might we look at at this point? So, one thing we might want to uh, to um, to uh, look at is the um, networking information for our particular pod. So, again, we'll run the IP command there, and you know we found the the pod IP address here, ten dot two four four dot one dot six, and we're going to make a note of that and come back to that information a little bit later on. Uh, so we know what IP range our pod is in. We've got an IP address for our pod. Uh, so let's see what else we can do. So by default in a Kubernetes cluster, every pod has a service token auto-mounted in it, which is associated with the um, service account that was used to create the pod. And you can control whether this is auto-mounted or not by setting um, auto mount service account token um, is is true or false, and you can set that on the pod or the service account. But let's see whether we have that mounted inside our um, our cluster. So I'm going to try and uh, run curl from inside this pod. Uh, I'm going to just cat actually. I'm not going to run curl yet. I'm going to just cat the uh, where I think the service account token should be. And as we can see, we've got a, a token there. So. Um, let's take update our our timeline of doom, and you know this is kind of an additional vulnerability here. I've been able to gain some credentials. I have this pod, uh, this um, service account token auto mounted inside my pod, so I have a set of credentials. Um, so let's see what we can get from the um, from the API server from the internal address of the API server using uh, this particular pod, pod uh, token. So I'm going to um, I'm going to uh, if I get the right link there copy link address I'm going to try and craft a uh, a curl command here and um, what's happened there uh, that should actually fail uh, what's going on here. Okay. Um, all right. So anyway, um, this uh, under normal circumstances, for some reason, this has actually failed. And I think maybe there's gone something's gone wrong with my demo. The last time I ran this, it most definitely worked. Um, and this um, what should have given me the external um, IP address of the API server. Um, if you run this in a normal Kubernetes cluster, 
um, it will give you the API um, uh, IP address of the API server. It, um, in in my case, I don't actually need this because I know where the uh, external um, IP address of the API server is. So hopefully that's not going to mean my entire demo is broken. Um, so we'll uh, we'll move on from that. Um, and uh, so we, we, what we did there was connect from the pod to the internal IP address of the API server. And um, our our pod token at that point should have allowed us access to the to the endpoints API, um, and uh, and given us that that extra bit of information. So what we're going to do now actually is is go back and take our um, token here, and I'm just going to configure my uh, local um, kubectl to use that token. Um, I actually have a handy little script here, uh, which I can use to. Uh, set up my kubectl. A token in, and in my case, I'm just running this Kubernetes cluster locally on my laptop, so I know where the uh, where the API server is. So we're going to. Um, I'll just make doubly sure I'm actually using that uh, that kube config. So now. Um, if I just pull this out a little bit, um, I'm going to try and use this uh, this token to get some um, more information about the cluster. So the first thing I'm going to try and do is just see whether I can um, see what pods are running. And so uh, this is in the default namespace. And so um, because I didn't namespace that command, so I, I've, I've not been able to list any pods there. But what it has given me is another set of information here. This um, this uh, token is associated with this um, service account, which is namespaced into this secure namespace. So what I'm going to do is try and uh, run the same command, but I'm going to namespace it to the secure namespace. And as you can see here, I'm able to actually list pods in the secure namespace. Um, so uh, at this point, um, we can also have a look what permissions this this token actually has. And I can use the kubectl uh, command. I can do kubectl auth can I, and I can do minus minus list minus minus token equals and pass it my token. And this is in the default namespace. And I can see that I don't actually have very many permissions at all in this default namespace. But if we um, run the same command and we namespace that to the secure namespace, what we can see is that I have got a bunch of, of permissions in this secure namespace. And um, there are also a, a, a couple of other ways that we can view what permissions we have. Um, there's a, a plugin for kubectl called um, Access Matrix, which um, is, uh, gives you a very useful kind of uh, more human readable view. You can see here in the default namespace, I don't have any permissions at all, really. Um, but if I look at uh, my secure namespace, we can see we've got all sorts of permissions um, in that particular namespace. So what this is telling me is that um, this is a fairly common uh, misconception about security configuration in Kubernetes. So what we've done is we've created a namespace and we've given a user uh, permissions in that namespace. So we've sort of treated the namespace like a security boundary. And namespaces really are not security boundaries. Um, so what um, we were, what we've done here, we connected to our to our external IP address to the API server, and we now know that we've got this secure namespace and we've got a default namespace, and um, we've got insecure role here that's going to allow to have too many permissions in the um, in the particular namespace, and and as I said, namespaces are not a security boundary, and so. Um, we, if we update our timeline of doom here, that we've got this role that's been given too many permissions. So let's now try and, and get, um, if we look at the pods in our um, secure namespace, we'd see we've only got one pod running there. So we can fairly safely assume that is this, the uh, the pod that we compromised from the uh, um, outside with our remote command execution vulnerability. So let's um, get a shell on this uh, on this pod. IT and that pod um, in the secure namespace. I'm going to try and, and run a shell there. And so we've got a shell there. So, and we can see we're this web admin user. Um, so, uh, and we can prove that by doing who am I. 
So, you know, this is somewhat secure. We're not running as root here. And if I try and do sudo here to elevate my privileges to root, I don't even have the sudo command installed. So this is a fairly uh, decent security posture. You know, I'm, I'm not running as an elevated with elevated privileges. And I seem to be in, a, in an environment that's got a fairly minimal set of, um, of utilities available to me. So what I'm also going to try and do here is create files. And that has succeeded. I've been able to create a file. And this is another, um, another um, security uh, uh, problem here in the sense that um, I, I, don't ha I have a read-write file system, which means as, as an attacker, I can download software. I can potentially change the configuration. Um, I already know I have curl available because I, I discovered that earlier. Uh, so these kind of things are definitely possible. And this is a another um, vulnerability caused by not setting read-only root file system to true. So um, let's um, come out of there for a minute. I'm not going to attack on that vector. I'm just going to come out of that, of that container. And so now I know I have permissions in this secure namespace. Um, I'm going to try and see what other, what other things I can do there. So the first thing I'm going to try and do is I'm going to try and spawn a, uh, a, a root pod into that, um, into that namespace. And this is just going to start an Alpine um, container. I know Alpine by default runs as root. So I'm going to just going to try and apply that um, demo YAMLs uh, root pod. Um, and I'm just going to apply it in the secure namespace. So that looks like something happened, but let's take a, a, a closer look there. So what we can see has happened here is we've got this error, create container config error. So if we now describe um, that pod, and we'll give, give us a bit more information about what's actually happened there. So we can see from this output that um, there is something stopping me from running root pods within this namespace. So a uh, container has run as non-root, an image will run as root. This is likely a pod security policy in place on this, um, on this particular uh, namespace. So um, let's just clear that. So what I'm going to try and do now is to, um, to launch a, uh, a, a privileged pod, but that's um, not running as root. So uh, I'm going to try and, and launch this one. I'm going to use a, a container image that I know about in a public um, repository. I'm not going to run as root. I'm going to run as this user. But I'm going to try and set privileged as true. And with privileged, I can do all sorts of, of things. I'm effectively um, root on the node. And I'm going to try and do a host path mount there as well so I can mount the, the file system of the, of the kubelet. So let's try and, and apply this one and see what happens. Uh, non root privilege.yaml in the secure namespace. So we're, what we've we've and now found, we definitely do have a pod security policy in place. We can see that uh, that, we, that we're getting that error from the pod security policy, and privileged containers are not allowed. So uh, at this point, we can we can update our what we know about the um, about the environment. So we can see we've got a pod security policy in place on our secure namespace. Um, so let's see if that stops us from extending our exploit. So let's try something else. What I'm going to try and do now is I'm going to run a non-root, non-privileged pod. And, you know, we've lost the privilege. We're not trying to mount the host path. We're going to run as a normal user. Um, and let's see what happens if we, if we apply, uh, if we apply this particular uh, piece of YAML. Non-root, non-privileged secure namespace. So we can see now that that, that pod has um, been able to be created. And if we look at, uh, at kubectl get pods, we can see that this container is actually creating. And this is another vulnerability here because this cluster has allowed me to pull an arbitrary image from a public registry and start it in, in my namespace. I can fill that that uh, that particular um, pod with all sorts of hacking tools that I can use uh, to extend my exploits. So I know what's running in this pod. So um, what I'm going to do is once it started running, let's just check if it's running. It's running now. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, run 
the port forward command to port 8080 in my new sneaky pod um, because I know I have a service running there. And if I now start uh, a new tab here um, and go to localhost port 8080, I've, I've got an additional way into this particular um, pod because I'm running a web TTY here. So I've managed to gain myself um, some extra uh, uh, methods of, of, of moving around within the cluster. So if I do who am I here, I'm not running as root, I'm this sneaky user. But what I can now do is do this, sudo su, and I'm now the root user. And the problem here is that the pod security policy, it doesn't include allow privilege escalation equals false. So if we go back here, uh, so we've got our, we've got our uh, pod security in place. It's likely bound to that secure namespace. But allow privilege escalation is not set to false. And lots of people, uh, I've heard lots of people say that this is redundant if you have uh, don't allow me to run as root and to disallow um, and not, not to allow privilege. But it is important because, um, and I'll, I'll show you why. Because if I, um, if I uh, do, um, let's just do if config here, right? So, um, I'm 10.244.1.9 uh, here, and what I want to do is I'm going to try and map the uh, map the network here. So if I go back to being a normal user and I run, um, let's just get this command. I'll just copy this for the sake of speeding up a little bit, and we're going to do 10.244.1.9/24. Uh, and as a normal user. Um, this scan fails because it requires capabilities, kernel level permissions that I don't have as a normal user. But as soon as I am able to uh, to escalate my privileges there, I can now scan the network. And this, this tells me um, a couple of different things. Um, firstly, that there's no network policies in place. So I've been able to start sending out things over the network looking for other hosts. But also, it's told me something uh, pretty interesting because if you remember, right at the start, the pod original vulnerable pod that we had was 10.244.1.6, and that had a vulnerable application running on port 5000. Well, what we've discovered another host here, 10.244.1.7, and that's also running on port 5000, and that may be interesting to us. Maybe this is another um, another uh, vulnerable application. So. Um, Let's just go back and update our uh, our timeline of doom here again. So our pod security policy didn't allow privilege, uh, uh, didn't disallow privilege escalation, and um, we've been able to uh, to move out into the network. We've discovered another pod. Um, here's our sneaky pod here on port eighty eighty. We've been able to discover another pod here on port five thousand. At the minute, we don't know much about that pod. We don't know what namespace it's in. But um, let's go and try something else. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to try and create a tunnel from my uh, from my um, sneaky pod here. And we want to be tunneling to uh, 10.244.1.7 on port 5000. And this is going to establish a tunnel from my sneaky pod on 5001 to this new pod that we've discovered on port 5000. So I'm going to uh, start that tunnel running and I'll just show you in the, the diagram what we're looking to do here. So we've created this tunnel here. And so if I now um, stop my port forward here and I'm now going to, uh, I'm now going to port forward uh, to port 5001 on my sneaky pod. And uh, so let's now uh, um, have a look at uh, what's on port 5001. So we do have another instance of our vulnerable web application. So that's that's very interesting. So let's uh, see whether we can uh, get a token from this particular instance. And we do have another token there. So what I'm going to do is take this new token. I've discovered a new set of credentials. And what we're going to do is I'm going to um, configure my kubectl to use this new token instead. So let's just uh, change this. I'm going to do token. And let's just uh, copy that. This one. So, 
So now with this new token, I'm going to try and do Cooper to get pods in the default namespace. And straight away, I see I, this token has permissions in the default namespace. So um, when I uh, let's try our kubectl auth uh, auth can I command again minus minus list minus minus token equals our new token, and we can see we've got a bunch of permissions in the default namespace. So let's uh, let's update our 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 description here. We know now that this is running in the default namespace. So now let's try and create a privileged pod. Um, here, so um, little apply minus f. Remember, this is our um, uh, non-root privileged uh, um, uh, pod here, which uh, also did a host mount. So let's look back at what that's uh, what that actually did. So we can see we're going to run privileged here, and we're going to try and mount um, the the host file system. And it looks very much like that pod has actually deployed. And we can see it has deployed. So if I now go to um, this new pod that I've just uh, deployed, root, uh, proof. I'm going to run bash. So. I can now sudo to root. And what's now interesting to me is uh, that um, if I run the process, look at the process table of this container here, even though I'm root, I'm still only seeing the processes that were containerized there. So the processes that were running inside the container. But because I have the host file system mounted, I can now do to root and mount the host file system and change the root of my container into that. And now if I look at the process table, I'm actually seeing the process table of the kubelet. So I can see here all the container D processes. I can see various pieces of the um, of the control plane. And I would be able to see any other containers that are running on this particular on this particular um, machine. And so basically, we've been able to create a privileged pod and we've been able to mount the host file system. And at this point, the, because I have access to the host file system, I also have access to the token that the kubelet is using. So if I do um, export uh, kubeconfig equals uh, kubernetes uh, kubelet.conf, and I do kubelet will get pods in the kube system namespace, which is the, the uh, privileged namespace just for the um, Kubernetes cluster control plane, we can see that I can see all of the pods that are running the Kubernetes cluster. And so I can dig down into these. I can find out which particular nodes they're running on because I can also do kubectl get nodes. I can see what the nodes in my cluster are, are called. And this is all going to be very interesting in terms of other things that I can do. Um, but let's have a quick look if I try and start actually start pods with this token. And um, this, the kubelet token won't let me start pods like this. Um, but it does say that we can create mirror pods. And mirror pods, if we put some YAML into, et cetera, Kubernetes manifests um, on, a, on a kubelet, um, these will get automatically started. So I have multiple attack vectors now for how I can, um, how I can uh, start to attack the, the Kubernetes control plane. Um, because we've escaped the pod security policy, though, and we now know which nodes we have, and we know um, which uh, which um, uh, pods from the control plane are running on which nodes, um, let's uh, try a different attack vector. So um, I'm going to come out of this uh, out of this container, and what I'm going to try and do is I'm going to uh, run an etcd client. And because I know that I can mount the host file system, and I know which uh, which nodes the uh, the etcd cluster are running on, I can actually direct this pod to that same node that's actually running the cluster, and I can mount the configuration for etcd. So if I now exec that, um, I want to apply that. Sorry, uh, ML's etcd client. Uh, yep. Well, let's just wait for that to spawn. It's going to take a couple of seconds.
So there, that's running now. And what I can now do is exec the etcd client and just test whether I can connect to the etcd cluster. And I can see here that I am getting data back from the etcd cluster. So if we look, go back to our, so we update our timeline of Doom. We had no restrictions in the default namespace. Um, and what we've been able to do here is to create an etcd client pod and connect to the etcd cluster uh, that's running in the kube system namespace. Now, etcd contains lots and lots of interesting things, most in interesting of which of all really is secrets. So let's see whether there's any secrets stored in this etcd cluster. And we can see lots and lots of secrets here. The one I'm particularly interested in as an attacker is this one, the cluster role aggregation controller token, because I know that this token has cluster admin rights. So um, let's see whether we can get that token. Uh, and I need to put that uh, JWH X2 on the end. And I've been able to get this token from the etcd cluster. So if we now take this token, and I do kubectl or can I minus minus list minus minus token equals. And here we can see that I have the permissions to change cluster roles. So at this point, this is really game over now because I have a cluster admin rights. I can change, modify any cluster role, and I can pretty much do whatever I like with the cluster. So finally, we, we managed to get hold of a token that has cluster admin rights. So as I said, that's kind of game over there. Um, what could we have done to prevent this? Well, clearly, um, if we hadn't had a vulnerable application to start with, we wouldn't have ended up in this position. So scanning your application code for vulnerabilities before you deploy them to production. Um, you could also be scanning your Kubernetes YAML files. Most of the, all of the uh, the insecurities that I noted earlier um, in how the cluster was configured would have been picked up by Snake's um, Kubernetes scanner. And scan your container images to make sure that you don't have vulnerable code um, in them before you deploy them. Um, you can sign up for a free account um, with sneakadapt.sneak.io and, uh, and scan for all of these things. Um, I have to uh, give a big thanks uh, to lots of other people in the uh, Kubernetes security community who um, did most of the work really to, to um, allow me to put together this demo, in particular thanks to Mark Manning in Coldwater and Duffy Cooley. And uh, yeah, that's that's all, folks. Um, I hope you enjoyed it and are happy to take uh, any questions. Uh, thank you, Ross, Matt. Uh, I think it was, was a great session, obviously. Uh, yeah, I for can't me, hear you. Can you hear me? I can hear you now, yeah. There, there you are. Uh, I, was, I was thinking, um, following some comments in the, in the chat, I, I don't know. I think I'm going to connect now to my Kubernetes cluster, drop them, all of them, and start using laptops in my basement, something like that. <laughs> Honestly, uh, when when we have this kind of uh, talks on security, I always have the, the same feeling that the first time that I hear is like, oh, this is this is too much. This is too much. And when I was seeing your demo, getting the, the last token to get access to the whole thing was like, wow. <laughs> so actually, I, mean, you know, I, I, I think Kubernetes is is a powerful tool, right? It just doesn't give you the guardrails to, you know, uh, particularly upstream. I mean, the, the stuff that I've just been talking about there will not apply to to highly opinionated deployments, particularly OpenShift will actually stop you from, from being able to do stuff like some of that stuff out of the box. But, mm -hmm. you know, upstream Kubernetes, it's designed for you to be able to do whatever you want with it, right? So True. it's, it's the, the onus is really on you to understand where some of these edge cases are about about um, you know being able to uh, to 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 do things. I mean, clearly the privilege thing is the real. As soon as you as soon as you allow privilege pods, it's really game over. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And actually, you you solve uh, one of my questions. And please, uh, people from the audience, if you have questions, do not hesitate to to drop it in the Q and A or in the in the chat. But actually, you solve uh, one of my questions that I had. Like, okay. This is too much. How can I prevent this? I just switch off everything 
and the, the last slide no. was uh, really important. Yeah, so, and, and I mean, there are other things that you can do as well, right? I mean, um, a pod security policy is actually about to be, uh, is in the process of being deprecated. There is a, a cap out to replace that um, with a, I've forgotten what they're calling that. I've slightly lost track of that conversation. But I mean, you can also look at, at admission control in other ways, right? So things like uh, OPA with gatekeepers, a very common uh, configuration, which will allow you to to stop things from from getting to the API server, mm -hmm. that which where they don't have the security context settings config correctly configured, and you can also mutate. Uh, things at, at the emission control stage as well. So you can say, well, I, I want everything in my cluster to have, uh, you know, this set of security contact settings um, and, uh, and um, you know, add that in whenever I make a request to to deploy a pod, um, add it in. But, I, I, you know, speaking from personal experience, I know that there's a lot of confusion around security context. You know, the documentation is, you you really need to be looking at the Kubernetes API docs to understand what some of these settings actually do. Absolutely, absolutely. Actually, I was I was thinking. I mean, uh, when when you go to a cloud provider, um, it's like super easy, right, to to set up a Kubernetes cluster. Mm -hmm. Just in a couple of or maybe three clicks, you have bam over there. But from from that to to really uh, have something uh, really uh, that important and uh, that you have to take care. They are a long, long ride, right? I mean, that uh, timeline of noon is is really something to take care of, for sure. Okay, uh, I don't know if uh, there is uh, any other questions. I think it was a, a great, a great presentation. Uh, if there is no more questions, uh, I think we can we can uh, put the ribbon over there. I will uh, start sharing the screen back. Uh, just just to finish, uh, again, uh, uh, this is the call for papers, as uh, Daniel and, and Matt, uh, if you, you want to, to participate in, in one of the events that we have, please uh, scan that or go in that direction, or just contact us uh, via social media, uh, on, on the, via email or the web page. And this is, this is all. Uh, I really want to thank uh, all the attendees, um, very, very hard. Uh, both speakers, Daniel and Matt, uh, this one uh, of these uh, events that I really enjoyed, both of them, because uh, they are very, very important topics nowadays. Observability plus security in the Kubernetes world, in the distributed and closed systems is totally key. So thank you. Thank you very much for the effort or for the time being with us. For having us. Perfect then, so we can we can close here. And um, again, uh, for the people that is uh, showing us uh, offline, uh, very uh, huge, uh, and see you in the next time. Cheers. <laughs>